All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, reminding you brand new interviews every Monday and every Friday right here on YouTube. If you want to subscribe, that'd be great to do that right now. You can also go down into the link, click on Patreon, pick the tier you want, and then you could be asking the questions of my guests next and also watching interviews before anybody else does. Okay, today, this is a busy one. Sometimes you get a guest who has one thing and you say he's from that thing, but not the case today. Jean Bouvois is joining us. He has had an elaborate career, all kinds of cool stuff. I know a lot of people want to hear about Kiss and we'll get into that, but for me, Plasmatics, Ramones, these are huge things. He's also had some amazing solo music. He has a book coming out. It's available for pre-order now. It's, it's still a little while out, but you can get it. It's called Bet My Soul on Rock and Roll, Diary of a Black Punk Icon. And I want to make sure everyone gets that. Link's in the description. He also has two solo records. They're compilations of his, his music, and those are called Rock Masterpieces, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Those are also available. We're going to get into it all right after this. All right, here he is, Jean Bouvoir. Hi, everyone. What's Jean, happening? I am so glad to have you. Um, there, there's all kinds of things that I want to get into. I got to ask you, though, you know, you're, you're, you have got a trademark for your mohawk. Do you <laughs> ever think, man, I've had enough of this? <laughs> uh, you know, I've taken a couple of breaks. Actually, when I lived in Germany, I took a little break for a while, and I kind of changed it and went just for like a, a braid in the back, almost like a... Chinese braid. You remember those the things are Thai, Thai, you know, like, like Thai kickboxer guy kind of braid. And it was okay, but eh, I didn't feel quite, you know, I didn't feel so comfortable. And every once in a while, I do take a little break and I just get into hats or I shape completely and, and just, you know, let things uh, <laughs> breathe. With that, with that said, <laughs> people want to see it, you know. This, uh... I know, I know. And, you know, and I to tell you the truth, I'm most comfortable with the mock. It's, it's it's really funny. It's like, doesn't matter what you change it to. It's just, you know, maybe it's been so long, but most of my life, you know, I mean? so it's, uh, it, it's really, you know, it's you, it's just, you know, the clothes fit right this way. Everything just seems to work better, you know. Well, your, your life in music and your style starts really young. You're from Chicago. But at, you start playing music at 14 years old. First of all, how do you learn to play music at 14 years old back then? Well, I mean, well, it started well choirs and stuff at the very beginning, like singing in the kids' choirs in school. And then um, I think the first instrument I picked up in school was the um, recorder. You remember they used to make everybody play that little yes, thing? Yes, I like, was terrible. <laughs> that was the first instrument. And so in school, I played saxophone. That was around that that time. But I started messing around at home really early. That's where it really, you know, began. My brother had a bass. He was, you know, eight years older than I was. And he was into different things. So I snuck into his room and I started messing around with that, for one thing. Um, I loved drums. So um, I actually had gotten a drum set. It was a trade for a motorcycle or a mini bike <laughs> at the time. And I started playing around with those and messing around. So. I, I was always interested in music, so I started messing around, probably around you know, 12, 13, and it went fast. See, that's that's the thing, because in that short period of time, from 13 years old, junior high school rock band to 14, I was already heading out on tour. Yes. So but I, I put a lot of time into it, let's put it that way. So I learned yeah. fast, but it was, you know, I, I'd play hours a day and hours a day at whatever it was I was trying to perfect at the time. 14 years old, you head on the road with Gary U.S. Bonds, you know, a, a legend. It's it's a pretty crazy thing. So how does that happen so fast? Okay. Well, I had um, a junior high school rock band, first of all. I had a teacher, uh, my math teacher, who had opened up for the Who once uh, with the band that he had. So he, you know, we started talking. He saw that I was really into the people saying, oh, he plays drums, he plays drums, he plays, you know, he's starting to play bass and stuff. And so he approached me. And we said, let's put together a junior high school rock band, so much like School of Rock now. Um, and so we would pick whoever was interested in learning an instrument 
or you know, basically, you know, three singers, a couple of piano players or something who already had some skills, you know, mom threw them in class since they were six, you know, that kind of a thing, you know, some guitar players who wanted to play guitar. And we started this little program. And then, you know, and then we'd play at school dances and different things like that. A little bit like fantasy camp when you think about it, you know, for, for kids, you know. Um, and that's how it all started. And so we started playing school dances and doing things. And the next year, which would be the second year of it, um, when school ended, I said, you know, I don't want to stop this. I'm digging this, you know. So how about during the summer, I just work it out. I'll uh, lie about my age. <laughs> we'll just, you know, play some local pubs and clubs around like this. And uh, I, I think the first name was Boo and the Gang. And um, uh, then, and then uh, Boo and the Gang and then uh, Topaz. So we started playing around in these little clubs and believe it or not, lo and behold, Gary U.S. Bond's manager happens to be in the audience. And so he approaches me after the show and he says, hey, you guys sound pretty good. You know, Gary's looking for a new band. And, um, you know, would you be interested in doing something like that? Go on the road, et cetera. He doesn't like to rehearse too much. So you have to really just do the whole thing. He's looking for something self-contained. And at that point I said, that's great. Okay, went to his house on the weekend, met with him. You know, he nicknamed me Boo Boo, and he says, "Okay, you got the gig. That's it. I'm not doing a lot of rehearsing or no rehearsing. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. I'll meet you in Sarasota, in Florida. That's the first show, and I had to get down there with a the truck, no license. <laughs> I got a couple of other older guys into the band, um, and then from there took off, and that was the beginning of the whole thing." Yeah, it's, that's it's, how it's, I ended up on the road at 14 <laughs> until he found out I was 14. <laughs> oh, it, it, really? Yeah. What was that like? Well, at the end, actually, at the end of that run, um, he walks into my room one day. He says, hey, Boo Boo, we got to talk. He said, <laughs> he said, I just spoke to your mom and she told me you're, you're going to be 15. So you got to go to school. You just got to go to school. Because I, in my mind, I was like, that's it. I made it over. <laughs> Why go to school? You know, Why do anything else? And he said, no, you got to go back to school. And, you know, I said, I'm not playing with you, though. This is this is what I want to do. This is. And he said, listen, I'll get you out of school, you know, like a day early or day after we're doing because he did a lot of fly gigs, you know, like people are doing now with the weekends, Playboy Club in Chicago, this, that. And he would literally get in touch with the you know teachers and say, hey, I need Boo Boo on Thursday. I'd get off a day early and he get me here or get me there. And that's how I did it. And I played with him for you know a while, on and off for a couple, two, three years, actually. How amazing. You, you, I feel like cool <laughs> things like that don't happen anymore. Uh, no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. And, uh, next, the Flamingos, you do that for a little bit, right? Yep, that was it. So from doing shows with him, I actually run into the other oldies groups because we do these Dick Clark Rock revival shows. Right. So everybody, the Platters, the Flamingos, all these different people would be, you know, there. And they had heard me sing. And then one day I get a phone call saying, hey, listen, we're looking for uh, to replace the singer. They had four singers. And it was back in the days of still. And these were the original members, you know, Jake Carey, Zeke Carey, the big low, you know, um, boom voice, the, you know, the bass voice. It was really quite the experience, you know, to work with these guys doing the, you, know, you heard their harmonies on I Only Have Eyes For You. It's a fantastic sure. stuff. So we did that and um, I joined them. They threw on a white suit. <laughs> they gave me a white suit and these shoes that were way too big for me. And I believe the first show was Nassau Coliseum. Wow, <laughs> New, York. New York, yeah. And then that's it. And uh, I actually have one picture that I found that'll probably be in my that in my book. It's not a great quality photo, but somebody got managed to get one shot well, of us. You have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's so it's funny. So you, you start this young age, fourteen. Um, Gary U.S. Bonds, flamingos. What could be more different? And we're jumping ahead, obviously. But but this, um, <laughs> you know. Ah, <laughs> so obviously this is the plasmatics. There could not be a, a more sort of cutting edge punk band at the time. And I was saying to you earlier when we were talking that I feel like the plasmatics is always going to have this uh, resurgence. I'm surprised it hasn't had a bigger one. Obviously the Ramones mm -hmm. have become more famous after and so many other bands, but plasmatics was doing things 
that are ridiculous. And so for those who don't know plasmatics, maybe give us a quick explanation. Yeah, it was a crazy band, no doubt. We definitely pushed the envelope. <laughs> um, it was the perfect thing for me when I when I joined them. You know, it was um, you know, after this whole flamingos and all the rest of this, I'm not going to get into too much because I have a book coming out. Remember, right. but I mean, as I um, after I, uh, I found myself in New York at one point, really still feeling like a rebel. I joined this band called NYN. It was actually called the New York Niggers, believe it or not. I hate saying the word, but that was the name of the band. Yeah, and I was the singer for this band. And um, we ended up opening for the Plasmatics at a little club called My Father's Place. And then from there, you know, I saw them the whole thing. I said, wow, this band's outrageous. It was just the beginning. They were just getting started at this time. So it wasn't really, you know, fact or anything, but it was definitely, you could see where things were going. And then next thing you know, I see an ad in the Village Voice uh, that they're looking for a bass player. Even though I was a singer in the old band, I said, yeah, I play bass and I play bass with Gary Bonds and that's my thing, so let me audition. I auditioned, there, was a bunch, there were a bunch of people auditioning actually. And then finally, after a while, I got a phone call saying, listen, if you want it, you've got it. <laughs> and then next thing you know, I found myself in, in the band and uh, there we were just, you know, starting to get things to go. You know, and it was just at the period where things were starting. So we, you know, we had we didn't have a record deal yet. So from there, got a record deal, and then the band was uh, it was a wild band. You know, first of all, we all had these uh, our images. You know, Richie was six foot seven <laughs> with uh, wearing a tutu, or sometimes a nurse's outfit, a Playboy bunny outfit, and it was you know really great entertainer on stage flying around the stage in those high heel shoes. You know, Wendy, she she was, she, she did everything from, blue, you know, we blew up cars, uh, chainsaw and guitars on stage, smashing TVs, amplifiers would blow up, chickens falling out of the ceiling. I mean, every night was lethal. You, know, you never knew if you were gonna come out alive, which is I think one of the reasons why people love to come to the show, because it was just so unpredictable and just so outrageously, wild that um to say the least yeah. we're looking at 1980s new hope for the wretched record cover right here um That's it. so i feel like you know a lot of punk rock you become imitate there's there's imitators do you, you know mm -hmm. and, and people try to come up with gimmicks but this is so ahead of its time like you said i mean she's shooting guns on stage blowing up cars <laughs> and what i find interesting about wendy and, and maybe you could talk about her a little bit is you know, she was a vegetarian her whole life. I think mm -hmm. she was straight edge most of her life. I think people associated her with drinking and drugs because she had, you know, a difficult life. And ultimately, you know, she committed suicide um, and she had a, a few attempts too. She was a troubled person, but yeah, it's, yeah. I think the person is very different from what the perception is. So maybe you could tell us a little. Well, I mean, first of all, I, to me, I mean, she was a really kind, kind girl, passionate, definitely passionate about the music. I think she really probably was fishing around most, most of her life trying to figure out what she wanted to do, what she wanted to be. And I, I believe that in the plasmatic, she was the happiest. That's really where she found her calling because she just loved the audience. She loved the attention, but she loved performing for these people. And you know, when you're, when you're in a rock band, especially something like the plasmatics, you know, the, what's coming back at you is powerful. And it can be a lot more powerful than any drug, you know what I mean, or any drink that you can have because it's just, it's constant, it's an approval, it's, uh, you know, it's, you're making all these people happy. It's, it's, and I, I really think that that's what motivated her the most. So she wanted to be in great shape because just getting through a plasmatic show was, was, it was a trip. You know what I mean? It's like, we couldn't go up there. Trust me, if we were high trying to do that show, we'd get killed for sure. Either the hood would fall on one of our heads, get right. shot by something. <laughs> something would happen. You know? You'd be slipping. I mean, it, it was dangerous up on that stage. So you really had to have it together. So yeah, she was um, she was healthy. She was up five miles a day. Nobody did drugs. Nobody in the band did jobs. We just, just you know, like eight hours a day, a week, a day, you know, like week, day off, um, but maybe two days off maybe sometimes. Days off and it was, um, that was that was our life completely, you know. Yeah, and the, and the, and if you watch the live performances, the songs are tight. You know, I think people think 
sometimes the image becomes bigger. Oh, they're crazy. Mm -hmm. When you listen to the songs, there there are songs, and I think that uh, and there's songs that have la have lasted that sort of test of time. Tell me a little bit though. How does this these this happen? I I, I call it a gimmick, but. How, where do you find these cars? I watched this one video you guys are playing in New York. Not only are you going to blow up a car, you're going to drive it into the river. <laughs> that was, does this happen? If anybody's going to see anything, they should go look at that video, the Pier 62 video on YouTube. It's still to me when I look at it, I like look at it and say, uh, what, I was a part of that. <laughs> That's my childhood. You know, but it was um, exactly that. We took it to the fullest that we did a six song set and um she drove a car she went like 50 yards out got in the car drove it into the stage and everything was it was it was the first peer show let's put it that way because you know after that they started all these peer series and dr pepper peer so that was the first peer uh show and concert at the pier like this and we had it worked out where everything was right at the edge of the river so everything once that car went up the ramp and hit the stage everything went into the Hudson River. We actually had to hire um, frogmen for a couple of weeks because of the deal with the city to make sure we got everything out of under there. <laughs> so it was quite, it, it was a trip, it was a trip. It's just, um, we'd buy the car, we'd find the car, and then we'd blow it up. <laughs> it's like, we'd find the TVs, you know, our crew would get the stuff, and at the very beginning, we got the stuff. You know, we'd go out there looking for the things. We'd get in the car and, you know, go run errands and go get stuff to to make the whole thing happen. Because, you know, we didn't have financing. We weren't funded by a record company at the beginning. So um, it, it was, you know, we just kept putting it in and people were getting into it. it was, and it was a lot of fun. We were digging it, you know, as rebels, you know. Oh, for, uh, for sure. And uh, first of all, there's got to be, a, someone's got to make a plasmatics movie. If there's a band that needs a movie uh, and that has a that has a cast of characters, this is it. Um, I, I agree. I agree. I think that, like you just said, I mean, um, I think I was really a part of something special at that time, especially with that lineup, because we each satisfied such, you know, a different, almost like a different audience. You know, I was only black guy with a blonde mohawk. There were no black people going to punk shows. <laughs> period, you know, or rock shows. And that changed the perception of a lot of people. And Richie, you know, just the way he was, you know, he's like androgynous. He was just like the, the six foot seven, like I said, with the outfits that catered to certain people. And Wendy catered to everybody, well, you know, and so I think it was a really interesting balance, the way the band was. And it's, um, yeah, I think it made yeah, a much sure. impact. And you know. now, and as you said, there's nothing more punk rock than having a black guy with a blonde mohawk at this time, especially. At and that time, uh, that's right. What was it like playing, you know, touring, going, if you're going to the South and going to places that probably don't understand this? It was hell. I went through literally hell. <laughs> I mean, to be quite honest, it, was, it wasn't just the South. I went through hell right in New York. It was like, you know, I couldn't go to movie theater. Well, this is... Honestly, it was right before the plasmatics broke. Now, once we hit television, right, everything changed overnight. And it went from, you know, not being able to go anywhere or do anything, you know, where I'd get, you know, people would be screaming and you go to a movie theater, everybody would be getting up, ah, look at this, <laughs> I'd be to laugh the whole theater, you're, you know, laughing while you're trying to have a date, you know, and you got cabs wouldn't be stopping, I'd be fighting in Times Square. I mean, it was just like, Hell, and a lot of blacks, especially, really were against it because they felt that I was going against the roots of black people to have blonde hair. Right. You know, so it was like, how dare you? You know, what I mean, it's like, so it was. Um, that's sure changed, by the way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now it's like, you know, half the basketball teams, race car teams, everything, they're all running around with you know black guys with blonde mohawks. But <laughs> at the time, it was completely unheard of. Now, as soon as the band hit and we did Fridays and did these shows, then it was like we couldn't walk down the street without being, you know, a mob photographs. And we had to actually stay in and we would actually pick when we would go out, we'd go out together. And there was even rules as to not going to clubs, not going anywhere. It was pretty heavy. But yeah, so um, the South, I'd have to stay in the bus, you know, just, I couldn't go out. You know, Richie and Wes and everything would get my breakfast for me and everything because they, they just want to kill me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy to think about and when you think about civil rights in general 
these things mm -hmm. aren't that long ago. You know, when you think of uh, oh, not at all. Yeah, th these issues, and you know, say not that long ago, we're still dealing with these issues to this day. Obviously, yeah, you know, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, I think that there's progress that's been made. There's no doubt about it. But there, are, you know, but there are issues. Like I said, I mean, there was nobody, no black person had anything. Purple hair, blonde hair, nothing at the time. It was completely taboo. You know, where now, you know, fashion has changed quite a bit, and I think, you know due to some people suffering as we did <laughs> it kind of gave people carte blanche to now be able to express themselves as i put it <laughs> you know? for, for sure and yeah and, and you're a revolutionary in this world uh, in the punk scene and uh the beginning of that rock scene I, like you said now it, you know it wouldn't be uh it wouldn't be, so, it wouldn't be so shocking so <laughs> you you make three records with the plasmatics and mm -hmm. Management decides they want to turn them more into a metal band. You think that they should stay a punk band. I think I, I would agree that was the, the, mm -hmm. the, the niche that seemed to work, obviously, and the imagery that worked. But so you decide that you're going to, uh, um, you, you're thinking about moving on, and you get some advice from all people, da Diamond David Lee Roth, right? Diamond David, I know. You know what it was? It was we were. He, he actually came to a plasmatic show. I think it was Santa Monica Civic. And we were uh, hanging out. Um, First of all, I got a we had security there, and somebody told me, "Oh, these guys, a band named Van Halen is in in the parking lot, and they'd love to come see the show." And I'm like, "I loved them at the time. I knew them. They, I think they just had released that. You really got me around that time." And I was like, "I love this band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let them in. Let them in." And so they came in. Dave came, said hello. We hung out, and we kind of hit it off like right away. We were just talking and talking, and he said, "You know what? Let me. Why don't I take you out after the show? You know, let's." go someplace, let's go to Hollywood, let's go do some stuff. I said, all right, and so we did. He had like an old Mercedes, <laughs> if I remember, and um, I think he collected them at the time. Mm -hmm. And we we went out, he took me to some clubs and we started talking and he was like, oh man, you know, it's merchandising, you guys must be killing it. You know, because I, I think it was Santa Monica, either Perkins Palace or Santa Monica Civic, and it was packed, we did multiple nights, you know, so it was a lot of people. And he's got, he's like, oh, we're doing this and we have hotel room floors and I'm kind of looking and he's like, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, well, uh, you know, I was young. I was like 19, 20 years old, you know what I mean? And so he says, well, maybe it's time for you to, <laughs> you can do your own thing, you know, you kind of, you know, it's time to, to move on, you know, if, 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 if this kind of thing is going on. You know, and I, I, that wasn't the only reason, but I, it definitely gave me a boost as well, you know, because you're sitting there on your own, you know, it's nice to have support. If you're, you're thinking in your mind, it's time for me to move on for several reasons, that's a personal things and, and, you know, but if you have nobody to support you around to say, yeah, yeah, you're kind of like, am I being an idiot or <laughs> what am I doing? But um, it kind of gave me a little boost to say, yeah, that's it. I think it's time. You know, I know I want to be a solo artist. That's what I want to do. I've done my stint. I don't think that this is going to go much further yeah. going the direction that they're going. Anyways. That's, yeah, that's what I was going to say. You, you did, there probably wasn't much left for you to do that's going to be groundbreaking. You already blew up cars and chainsaws and it, it, you you did it. Yeah, and it that's and it proved that your decision was correct. Obviously, because you did go on to do that's your right. own uh, music. At, at, for a little while there, uh, Prince had some interest in you. He was the first person who got in touch with me. That's the funniest thing. It was his manager at the time, and I get a phone call, and they say, you know, Prince is interested and in, um, would like you to come, you know, play with his band. And I said, uh, uh, Prince? I said. Does he know the plasmatics? Because <laughs> I think this was the very beginning of print. Well, you know, he was just getting into some, you know, serious stuff, but he had a real sexual act and a real thing. Yeah. But they said, no, plasma, you know, he really loves the plasmatics. He's been at any show that he could make it to, which I found out later was, was true. And I said, well, I really want to do, um, you know, I, I love it, but I really want to do a solo album. That's really my thing. You know, I, I don't want to get distracted. I'm, I'm, that's it. That's where I'm going. And they said, well, we've thought about that. And, um, you know, he'll, he'll produce a solo record for you as well. And they had it all planned out, mapped out, and, you know, you play with them. He'll do a solo record for you. Still didn't feel right, you know. Um, at the time, there was a lot of segregation at radio and everything else. And I kind of felt like might be a little too close. And maybe he's trying to get me out of 
you know, the competition. <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? Yeah. At the time, you know, whether that was wrong or right, at the time, that's what I felt, you know, and I was, was everybody's real protective of their thing, you know, and you want to end up being somebody who's helping somebody else's thing instead of helping your own thing. <laughs> you know? Well, and I think some of your sound has a bit of a Prince vibe. I think if you're a Prince fan, you, you know, some of your stuff might be similar. And yeah, that was a big thing. Let me get rid of the competition. Also, <laughs> From people who've signed contracts with Prince, Prince sort of owned them. As much as he, as much as he had issues with his label, he signed these people to you know non-compete deals and yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was it just wasn't for me for that for, for several reasons at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then um you know then I met with some other people. Um, you know, little Stephen, I finally ended up playing with, but yeah. He, he just made sense, if you know what I mean. I had some other offers. I was I was very close with Billy Idol and um, Steve Stevens at the time. They were looking for a bass player, and they were like, "Why don't you just come and do it?" And we were out and doing stuff. I, I was helping them find a bass player, and they wanted to know the truth. And I was like, ah, "I don't want it because I just I wanted to be. I was determined to go for the solo thing." And then I ran into Steven, and Steven was just like, "You know, you're not gonna get a solo deal this way." He says, people see you blowing up cars, that's it. That They'll sign you to do that, but they're not going to sign you to sing. <laughs> you can forget that. So he says, unless you can do something that can get you some credibility. And uh, he made a lot of sense. And he said, you know, maybe playing with me, I'm taking a break from Bruce. You know, you'd be an important part of what I'm doing here. You know, it's almost like a Bruce and Steven thing. It's me and Steven thing. And um, he said, so if you learn a lot here and, you know, we'll, we'll cut some stuff, we'll cut demos, whatever, and we'll get you a deal. Let's do this. So made the most sense, and I joined up with Steven for a while. Yeah, and you guys made a bunch of records, played yeah, together. You, you, sang right. with Bruce, you sang with Bruce as well. That's and, right. That's right. Yeah, that's some pretty cool stuff. And yeah. so it comes this, uh, <laughs> so, which is a, which. Th this is a record that is just uh, it, it's it's underrated. That gets term gets used a lot. But I feel like, you know, if people give this a listen now, they, they're going to say, I really missed out on something. You might know some of the tracks. Drums Along, The Mohawk. Right. Um, this was a novel at 1936. That was where the title comes from. A movie <laughs> in 1939 directed by John Ford. That's or, right. I think Henry Fonda. But um, and so what uh, and, you know, Richard Branson, legend from Virgin, he's involved with you and, and signing. And there's a lot of people because you're doing the singles thing first. You, right, you know, right, right. It's yeah. kind of the old school thing, which is feels like John. It feels like it's come back. Now it's back to put out your singles and then maybe put an album out after that. Well, I mean, this came after you know I did the whole Stephen thing, and it was um yeah, it was great. It was a great experience, just as he had you know uh, you know basically suggested, and it, it was good. I I recorded stuff. I did a lot of, but it still didn't lead to a deal. Mm -hmm. At that point, um, I almost did. Uh, yeah, my had interest, you know, it was almost there, um, but it just didn't get there. So finally, I said to Stephen, I, I just got to go anyways. You know, it's just time, you know, after touring Europe and doing a bunch of things, because I said, I, I really need to put focus into what it is that I want to do. Um, I was about, I had gotten, um, I recorded some demos and I had gotten a deal offer from all people from ABBA. Mm hmm. Okay, and um, they said, you know, Polar Records in, in Sweden are interested in this single that you have. And so I was like, huh, okay, well, I was about to make that deal because every record company had turned me down, everybody. I, I, there was no chance anymore. And just as I was about to leave, I meet a publicist uh, who was a good friend of mine at the time. We would just go out to lunch, hang out. A guy named Howard Bloom turned out to be a, a great author and, and stuff, but he was a very big publicist at the time. And he said, well, before you go to Sweden, I think there's one guy you should meet, this guy, Gary Kerfhurst. And Gary's, uh, you know, he managed a lot of cool people. He managed the Ramones. He managed, uh, he brought Jimi Hendrix to America at one of the first times. He did a, a, a lot of, uh, he's got a big history if you look up Gary Kerfhurst. He's a legendary manager. And I said, ah, okay. He said, I really think, you know, he likes things that are different and interesting and you might be right up his alley. So before you go meet with him, I'll set it up. So he set it up for me. I went to see Gary and Gary said, I love everything I heard. This is great. I'll have you a deal within the next couple of months. And I was like, <laughs> he's dreaming, but okay. <laughs> if yeah. you think you can make it happen, I'm there. And um, he said, go to Sweden, but don't sign anything. Go enjoy the <laughs> you know, feast and everything else they got over there, but don't make any deals yet until you hear from me. 
And then it wasn't long before I got a phone call and he said, come to London. I'm here with Richard Branson and he loves what you're doing and he wants to sign you and um, he wants to meet with you. And that was it. Flew to London, met with him on a riverboat and voila, next thing you know, first solo deal right, right there. Did you play everything on that record? Yes. Yes, I, mean, I had a couple of guests for a couple of, uh, um, just a couple of, Tommy Lafferty played, uh, I think one one or two solos on the record and a little rhythm guitar and something. And Mick Jones from Foreigner yeah. played a solo on the record. Yeah, I love, I love Mick, actually, <laughs> of all people. Yeah. It was, I was recording in Media Sound and him and Mick Jagger were recording at one of the studios and they just popped in to say hello and hey what's happening i was like oh well, i was excited they were there and and um then i just i saw mick and i said why don't you just grab that guitar right there and you know maybe put a little something he said yeah go ahead give it to me and that was it and he played on one of the tracks yeah but i mean but very cool you talk about a solo record you <laughs> took it you took it upon yourself to do just that the song feel the heat the movie cobra 1986 yeah. this movie uh uh this song finds a new life through that movie that's right. And um, Sylvester Stallone was at Warner Brothers Pictures and he was editing that film. Um, you know, he was huge from Rambo right before that. So, um, and he happens to see Mary Lambert, the person who was editing my video, editing Feel the Heat. He hears the song, sees the video, and he says, that's it. This is, has to be the song for my campaign. For the, all the advertising, for everything, that's the song. And I get a phone call and um, you know, my, my manager says, you know, that he, I believe he said Stallone called and he said that he wants to use, this is it. He fell in love with this song. He wants to do a whole campaign with us for this, for this song. I'm like, wow, that's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. And um, so they took Feel the Heat. And next thing you know, funny thing I found out many years later is at first I was under the impression, oh, the movie didn't do that. Well, only to find out that it was the biggest release of any film in the history of film when it came out, which I didn't even know. 2,272 theaters, I believe it was, where Top Gun was 50% of that. So it actually did really well. And, uh, and in Europe, forget it, it was a very big boost for the song because you know all these different countries, they were Stallone, Stallone, Cobra, Cobra. And everywhere you went, you'd hear, you know, feel the heat was always there. I would say, you know, it's like a, for every trailer, every commercial. So it was a nice boost. And, uh, you know, and the imagery together was was cool too. It was powerful, it was rock, it was oh, Stallone, it's you know. It worked for sure. I don't think people realize how involved Stallone is in music. I, the Tiger is his choice. He was mm -hmm. going to use uh, for, for Survivor. He was going to use the Joe Esposito song, who I work with. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That ended up in Karate Kid because same director as John Avildsen. But if Stallone wanted something, he would get it. And say, uh, uh, excuse me, no easy way out is Robert Tepper. Robert Tepper. That's right. That's right. That's Robert right. Robert Tepper, right. who's on the Cobra soundtrack as well. No. And, mm -hmm. and Joe Esposito's song was called "You're the Best Around." But Stallone really knew if he like he wanted your song. He was going to do what he did to get it and give it a good promotion. And you couldn't ask for a better promotion. You couldn't ask for a better promotion. And I'm, I'm really, first of all, it's lasted forever. Because even up to now, mm -hmm. um, that film just sells and sells and sells. It's just like it it never ends. It's like, and it, it, they're even talking about doing a TV series from what I've you know, heard. So um, it's, it was just one of those cult films that got bigger as time went by. You know, kind of like rock and roll, kind of like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of like the Ramones, kind of like the Plasmatics, and everything else. You know, it's like a, like a fine wine. <laughs> yes, that's the thing to age. And speaking of aging, I jump past Kiss. So <laughs> people are, you know, you know better than anybody. Kiss fans are passionate about Kiss. Yep. And it for you it begins with Animalize, nineteen eighty four, and. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the years where you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think Gene was off doing other things. Maybe this is the beginning of the movies. He was to a certain extent, but um, you know, I don't really know if that. I know a lot of people have said that um, that it was like because he was off, that's why I ended up doing things. I wrote the songs with Paul, so we had a certain feel on those songs. Mm -hmm. And Gene was there most a lot of times in the studio when we were around. He'd be in and out. I knew Gene for a long time, and he'd come in, hey, Bouvoise, you know, the way he'd call me. That's how he'd call me, Bouvoise. You know, it's like, and it was always, uh, so, he, but he was very loose about 
things. He'd say, you know, since you wrote this song, they like the feeling of the bass on that song. Why change it? Have somebody relearn it? As a matter of fact, if I think of the songs, Who Wants to Be Lonely? I was just, uh, you know, thinking about this. Who Wants to Be Lonely? Grills in the Night and uh, All Night. Nobody plays the bass line like it's on the record live. No one. <laughs> Everybody just play. Both of those songs have a groove to them, you know. But nobody does that. Everybody just goes. That's it. There's no groove. There's no nothing to it. And live. It's very, it's interesting that I saw that nobody took really takes the time to really try to play it like the record. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so Gene was had that kind of an attitude. Like, ah, it sounds great when you play. Just play it. That's it. And I ended yeah. up playing on a few songs. And but at the time, it was it didn't really matter because it was ghost playing. It wasn't supposed to be known. <laughs> and right. I never looked at it as something that would ever be known. It's not until I saw it in like one of Paul's books or something that, you know, Jean played big. I was like, oh, <laughs> I had to look and see which songs I played on. I didn't even remember because it was just no. so casual. And Paul so, was playing some bass too. Yeah. I guess so, you know, it's like, well, that's true. Sometimes he did. So th there might have been occasions where maybe Gene wasn't around and he went in there and, and did a little something. But, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is Gene would just go for whatever would make it work. Yeah. And, and, he, yes, and, and that's also a good business in a sense, you know, uh, obviously, because, and they, they did, as time came out, they didn't make a secret about it. If you know, if you can save some time and save some money, and it's already done, um, <laughs> you know, get to it. And he probably and had, common, you know, it was common yeah. in those days. There were a lot of people playing on, you know, rock records here and there that weren't yeah. in the band. Yeah, absolutely. So you write these songs with with Paul uh, for Animalize. We're looking at it now. I think he played track bass on a few tracks on this record. I think three. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and so okay, so then uh, Asylum comes along you know, a year, a year later and the same thing. You wrote some songs with Paul. So how does that come about? Okay. Well, I mean, Paul and I just met on a friendly thing. It wasn't music based. It wasn't on, you know, based on working together. We met in, in, in a club, a New York dance club, kind of a little club called Heartbreak where people used to go to just hang out, actors, rock, rockers, everybody would just hang out in this place. And one day we just ran into each other, you know, he recognized me. I wasn't sure about him because they, they still were doing makeup. But I said, right. he says, hey, you John from, from the Plasmatics. I said, yeah, yeah. He says, I'm Paul from Kiss. I thought, ah, you know, this Paul Stanley from Kiss. Great. And then we just, we, we hit it up. We became friends. We started, we talked all night, we hung out. And then we changed numbers and then we just started Oh, I'm going to take you to this cool restaurant that I know over here. Or, you know, yeah, there's a shop that has these great clothes. And you want to check that out. But, and we had that kind of a relationship, a friendship for probably a year before we touched an instrument. And then one day we were just at his house, hanging out, eating Chinese food. And he pulled out a guitar and boom, that's how Animalize, I mean, Thrills in the Night came out. Yeah, so if Throws a Night starts on Animalize, then Asylum, this is, and to, uh, you know, the hit, Who Wants to Be Lonely? Is a, is a, a single and a video and a, you know a hit song yeah. and uh, obviously you play bass on that and then as yeah. you also mentioned, uh, oh, oh, uh, all night, oh, all night. It was also a single. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Full, full pronunciation. So <laughs> and this is a great thing, you know, to be part of that Kiss family is a great thing. You could do Kiss conventions and 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 the, you know these people are passionate about. They're Kiss-related people, so they are. They're great fans. They're the, and Kiss is really, really fortunate to to have that kind of an army and a support around the world like they do. It's not like they haven't gone through their trials and tribulations. <laughs> oh, Kiss yeah. has gone through their you know hard times and difficulties and everything else, like everybody has. But those fans, they've stayed pretty loyal. And get, and you're right. It is great to be a part of that family. They really um, and they they love anybody who's been involved mm -hmm. in as contrib contributed to. To what they love. They know the details. So while there's those fans of the Kiss Army, my I myself am in the Ramones Army. Mm -hmm. So to me and to millions of others, Johnny Ramone is the reason why I buy a guitar, the reason why I play music, all everything. Mm -hmm. Ramones was my thing, still is. Uh, I was fortunate to get to work with them in different capacities, get to know oh, them. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, the theme song that started off the show, that's Richie Ramone on drums, 
And uh, uh, from the Animal Boy record, there's my completely signed Animal Boy record. <laughs> All right, I saw it, I saw it on the wall, great. Oh, cool. And uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about this because the Ramones history has been a little cloudy as, a, as far as who did what. Not Kiss is, is 10 million books and everyone knows everything. Ramones is a little different, uh, different thing. And also you've got some pretty odd personalities, as I said to you earlier, I used to say to Johnny Ramone, how do you sit in a van with these nuts? And, uh, and there was times that I, I did some stuff with Dee Dee and I would, and this is later in his life. Mm -hmm. And Johnny would say, you see what I'm talking about? You see what I had? A, they were like the three stooges to me. Johnny Ramone was like Mo, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. and they were characters, but Animal Boy, you get involved again, Gary Kerfers, who you worked with is also involved, obviously managing the Ramones at this time. They bring you in to play, you play some guitar on this record, right? Uh, yes, 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 I did, yep. And yeah, you write I played, some, I played yeah. some bass, some guitar, <laughs> yeah. keyboards, piano. <laughs> Walter Lohr from the Heartbreakers also was playing guitar at this time. The story was that Johnny Ramone liked to have someone double his track that he played along to. And as everyone knows, he didn't play any leads. If there was anything like that, somebody mm -hmm. else did it. And he didn't hide that. Right, right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. He didn't like minor chords. He didn't like suspended chords, <laughs> things like that. On the records that I produced, um, I, I played, yeah, obviously I played um, anything, any of those things. Yeah. So, so pretty much, pretty much, yeah. Um, Johnny would lay down his tracks and then um, you know, any lines, any suspended, anything else I would do. So let's talk about this record a little bit, Animal Boy. Um, you, 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 so you wrote the songs you wrote on this record mostly were Dee Dee. Tell me what that process is like. Writing with Dee Dee? Mm -hmm. it, I, mean, I really liked the guys. First of all, I knew the guys long before, um, we worked together in this capacity, you know, cause being in the plasmatics and, you know, the whole CBG we see and everything, we'd always run into each other. So we just, it was like a family already. You know, we all knew each other. And then Gary at the at one point came to me and said, you know, I'm thinking it might be an interesting idea to have you produce the Ramones. And I was like, like I'm I'm always open to anything. So <laughs> it's like, I was like, yeah, great. Let's go for it. Did you speak to the guys? He said, yeah, they're in, they're in. I said, okay, let's let's go. And um, working, Dee Dee I knew already, and I, he's a real talent. I mean, he's just, how can I explain? You know, he'd just come to my apartment and I would just start playing a riff or something else like that. And he'd just hear something right away. He's really good with lyrics. He'd hear lyric ideas very quickly, to be honest, really, really fast or story ideas. They would come very quickly to him. So he was a really talented guy. I'm not gonna tell you he was, you know, the greatest bass player and, and everything. It's almost like that was secondary to him. He just did it <laughs> to be on stage. No, that's not what I mean, but you know what I'm saying. It, no, I absolutely do. He he inspired lots of bass players with his, you know, 16 note down stroke picking. Exactly. Exactly. But he felt at this point, he was quoted as saying, anybody can play this. You don't need me on the record. It's not a signature sound at this point. And you, you know. see, that's I didn't know he said that, but that's really interesting because that sounds exactly like something that he'd say. He's a really, he was a really intelligent guy. You know what I mean? And he had a good perspective besides getting caught up in whatever drugs and everything else right. he got caught up in. He had a, 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 he was very artistic in general. You know he, what I mean? He got the big picture. Th th there's a story that he wrote a song a day. It could be true. It's some, you know, by saying a song, maybe he wrote some lyrics, but supposedly every day he was coming up with something and some of them yeah. are, are ridiculous. And then other ones became songs. This record has Bonzo goes to Bitburg on it. Right, uh, right. My brain is hanging upside down because Johnny Ramone is a conservative, was a conservative type. Exactly. And yep. Although Johnny was cool enough to let the song be on the record, you know, that kind of, <laughs> Still pretty punk rock for a guy who's a huge Reagan fan. Now you have yeah. this song that's sort of bashing Reagan and, okay. and Reagan's visiting of the uh, of the cemeteries, you know. And so, tell me a little bit about writing that song. Well, the, you know, it's funny because I've seen so many different stories about how that song was mm -hmm. written. Basically, um, I you know I had the music, you know, with the Ramones, I pretty much write all the music. That's mm -hmm. just something that 
was just automatic. And then um, from there, they'd either contribute some melody parts at times or lyrics. So that's why, like, for example, with that song, we're credited, I'm 50% and Didi and Joey of 25, 25 each. So it's, um, there was an idea about this whole Reagan thing. We, we talked about it and it was, uh, we were saying, we're thinking that, first of all, we were angry about what was going on. And we were thinking whether we should write a song that was political like this. There was a little question about it because you know it's not something that the Ramones are used to doing. Right. Me, I love going against the grain. So <laughs> it was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. You know, I think it's gonna be fine, especially the whole idea of Bonzo goes to Bitburg. I thought it was fantastic. So um, and like you said, Johnny didn't love, you know, like the idea um, too much of the title. So we had to have a little back and forth discussion about that before we all agreed to change it, you know, because he wasn't a writer on the song, so he really has no say <laughs> on what the title is, you know. But um, but of course, you're trying to be diplomatic, and that's another thing as a producer, and when you're working with them, you have to try to balance everything. You have to try to keep Seymour Stein happy, Gary Kerr first happy, the band happy, you know, and it, it's tough. You got the managers telling you, don't worry about what they say. Just do that. And then Seymour's telling you another thing. Then Joey likes piano and strings, and and Johnny wants to keep it only guitars, and then Dee Dee's somewhere else, and you know. So that's it's a difficult. Yeah, I was pulling my mohawk out of my head <laughs> a few times making this record. I'm not gonna lie. And then the girlfriends too, of course, had a lot of say. So Dee Dee's girlfriend, who I don't know what her, her name at the time. Was it, what wasn't Vera at that time, was it? Vera, I think it was Vera. Yeah. Was it Vera? She was a sweetheart. But, you know, I had probably as many conversations with her as I did with Dee Dee. You know, right? you know I'm exaggerating, but you know what I'm saying? He, he was very concerned. Dee Dee was very emotional and passionate about things. And if he did something, um, he'd feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. He'd call me and say, John, you know, um, I don't know. For example, we had one, I'm not gonna tell you the line, but we had a line on one of the records that he said, and it talked about another artist. Then he calls me, I'm in Sweden, doing some mixing and doing some stuff on the record, putting everything together. He's in New York, he says, John, um, I think uh, we've got to change that line because he's not gonna be happy. I think he's gonna get mad at me. <laughs> you know, in that way, you know, and I, I even missed the way they talked because it was like, you know, he'd be real emotional about it. He's going to be mad at me. I don't know. I said, OK, don't worry. And I had him actually go grab a cassette player. I told him, put the cassette player in the corner of the room, play the song, go all the way in the other end and then just record it into one of those little recorders, the new line. Mm -hmm. You know, where I can't hear the other thing and just send it to me and I'll put it into the mix somehow. So I had to grab this little recorder track and change the line on the record, you know, opposed to things that were done with U87s and all that, everything. Yeah. But we made it work. You made it work. So he was just he was infamous excited. for changing he was infamous for changing his mind. I was with him three days before he passed away here in Las Vegas. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, I was sitting in this little dressing room at a club called Pinkies. Uh, mm -hmm. and we're talking and he's saying, uh, maybe I should just go home. You know, uh, there you go. That was That's he always good. wanted to go home. He, he get halfway <laughs> somewhere. I want to go home. And then he said, they asked him, do you want to eat something? He goes, I don't know. Do I want to eat something? And then, uh, and then, well, how about a cheeseburger? Eh, maybe I want a cheeseburger. No, I don't know if I, you know, everything with Didi was all over the place, but he was, uh, uh a genius in his own right and obviously inspired so many. Um, I loved them. I loved them. I really did. I, I, you know, I miss all, all of them. They were all great to me. I, you know, nobody ever gave me a hard time. I know people call, you know, say John, he was a hard ass and everything like that. Yeah, he could be, um, how could I say, fixed in his ways. I mean, he had a vision, you know, and I, I always respect that when people have a vision of what it is that they see, what they want to do, it's clear in their mind, that's where he wants to be. So it takes sometimes a little nudging to get people to see things a different way. But as you can hear on that record, everybody did nudge a little bit here and there. Sure, and I don't think, you know, it took someone like Johnny to keep them together. And they all said that too. If Johnny wasn't the drill was sergeant, the that's you right. Know, right. Joey would be back at his house touching things, you know, with his OCD and, you know, they, and Didi would go and cop, you know, or, 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 or whatever it is. Did you ever see the uh, video where Didi, 
where Didi explains why his rap career didn't work. You ever see that one? No, I didn't. What is it? What did, how did I got it? Talks about uh, everyone can watch it on YouTube, but he talks about that he understands rap music because he understands the oppression of the black man, right? <laughs> and school ED, okay. and they're oppressed. And then he, but he says, he talks about his rap career, and he goes, eh, "It didn't really work. I wasn't very good. I'm not a Negro." <laughs> <laughs> so, there's Dee's. He said, yeah, he said, yeah. He said, you know, and I, that's what made the band so great too. Is it, it's they were characters. They were really characters, and they were it, real characters. It wasn't invented, you know. Mm -hmm. it, you know what I mean? They were who they were, and it's um that and a really interesting combination too. They could have a TV show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Nineteen eighty nine. Brain Drain. Here's a record um, that Dee Dee does not play any bass on, from what I hear. Um, I believe Daniel Ray played the majority of it. Um, mm -hmm. Dee Dee did sing a song, "A Punishment Fit the Crime," on this record. Uh, but this was he was. This is the rap career is happening, and he's also uh, he's going to be leaving the band very soon. Big questions about this record. There's two really popular songs. You're involved in both of them. I believe you produced them as well, which is "Merry Christmas, I Don't Want to Fight Tonight" and "Pet Cemetery," which ends up on the Stephen King soundtrack. I right. have always wondered. Exactly mm -hmm. who played what? I finally have somebody here who can explain it to me. So let's start with Pet Cemetery. I'm not going to remember. <laughs> you played guitar on that song. What? You played guitar on Pet Cemetery, right? I do play guitar on, on Pet Cemetery, and Daniel Ray did play something on that as well, from what I remember. It's yeah. a long time ago. Um, and this is a long time ago we're talking now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and things were, if I can be honest, I mean, a lot of times I'd have the band come in, we'd record a bunch of stuff, and then the engineer and I would sit at the end of the night and just that, that, keep that, that goes, that goes, that goes. And I'd just replace anything that needed to be replaced. Yeah. So and I played bass on that song. Um, I definitely played guitar on that song. Um, I believe Daniel Ray played some guitar in that song as well. It's obviously credited, right? Did it show how it it, it, it should be credited on the record? Yeah, but it's loose. You know what I mean? It's not credited <laughs> on the album. One of these things you find out later, you hear, oh, I did this, I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, there's a guy named, uh, there's an article called Sound on Sound that um, Fernando Crawl, the engineer who worked on that record, it's a really interesting read because it talks it gives you every detail of the recording of that song. Yeah. From the minute we started, did you ever read it? I, I did read it and it still left me with some holes. <laughs> um, that's why I hit you. But those two tracks, <laughs> Pet Cemetery and Merry Christmas, I Don't Want to Fight Tonight, they don't sound like typical Ramon songs. And there are guitar parts that you can tell uh, Johnny Ramon didn't play. What about the Christmas course, song? Yeah, I, yeah, same same idea. I mean, I played, uh, tell you the truth, Merry Christmas, I've got to go back and listen to that, but I, I could have very well played. I always kept something from Johnny in there, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it was one of those things, because I didn't feel like, I mean, it's the Ramones. So you have to somehow, I think, represent, you know, in one way or another. So whether it was that I'd keep his rhythm, I'd always have him come in and do like a basic rhythm part that would go through the whole thing. He'd do his parts. Then from there, I could, so in other words, you know that sometimes you, you can have a part where you have suspended, but everybody doesn't have to play the sus, you know right. what I mean? So, you know, so I could do that and then I still have his ringing in the back, you know, anyways, you know? So I always had him doing stuff, but otherwise I would just come in and play the other guitars. Yeah, I feel like that it, someone played the intro to that song, it's not him. You know, the beginning of Merry Christmas, I Don't Wanna Fight Tonight, probably you. Oh, I'm gonna say, probably it was probably me who played that one. That's right. Ring, nothing. This is I don't want to fight. That's right. That was probably me who played that. Yeah, because yeah. you know Johnny didn't do that. Um, <laughs> it's a little interesting though, because you produced those songs, but Daniel, I think, did the rest of the album. So how, yeah. how did that happen? Well, I mean, um, when it came to the record company, they they um, the film company. The film company wanted you know me to come in and, and do that, and the yeah. record company as well, because they just felt like this Pet Cemetery was really a shot to, you know, a single. They, there's a commercial aspect they wanted to the songs. Yeah, let's put it that way. That I guess you know I'm not gonna blow my own horn here, but I guess obviously they felt that I could bring another flavor 
to the song that would give it a commercial edge or bring it to a little different place than where the other things were going. So Pet Cemetery, that's what happened because I, mean, I found out later that Pet Cemetery was the highest charting song that the Ramones have ever had in their career. Supposedly went number four. And I, and I didn't even realize that till actually a few months ago <laughs> or about a year ago when somebody told me, you know, that's the most, the highest charting song. I'm like, wow, okay. And I you know, hear it on the radio and it's, it sounds great. But you know, it doesn't sound like a typical Ramon song. It has, obviously it sounds like the Ramones because Joey's singing and it's got, you know, the elements that make it the Ramones, but it sounds like a different record a little bit, right? Do you know what I'm saying? For sure, and but the Ramones always wanted that. The Ramones was the band that always wanted to break through. They always thought, you know, the next record's the one. So if something's a little more commercial and it's in the Stephen King soundtrack, it's the chance to expose the music to more people. And I think a lot of people got into Ramones around that time, you know, a younger generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I, yeah, I don't like to use the word commercial, you know, that's probably a bad word because it's almost like people think that you come in and I've got like a little uh, suitcase of commercial sound. <laughs> Let me think, what's going to get me on radio? Hmm, commercial piano. <laughs> it's, it's not exactly that. It's just, I think what uh, what the Ramones and, and I got right, it was the combination. It was something about the combination of elements you know, like even if you listen to some of my solo records, I, I loved Bells, for example, and, you know, th there were certain sounds that I liked sounds that were a little bit different and weird and things that actually weren't commercial because people weren't really using them. It's just, just things I liked, you know, and for some reason, the combination of those elements that I liked and, you know, adding, you know, adding little things. I always felt that adding little elements um, to what the Ramones did would make it more like intelligent punk. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. What if that makes any sense? No, no, I, I think it does. Yeah, intelligent punk. It's almost like intelligent rock. It's I was like, it's a, you're singing a rock song, and maybe I'll bring in some kind of harmonies. You know, I sang with the flamingos for God's sake. You know what I mean? Right. So you 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 have a different sense of harmony and things that you have in your toolbox that maybe a guy who's you know just in a rock band just just doesn't have. You know, and if you combine that with a certain rock sound and real metal guitars and everything, you're gonna get a blend of something that's special. It's the same thing with the Ramones. You don't have to be Liberace or something to put a piano part in a Ramones song that's, that you'll do it is very simple. You keep right. it simple, but it's still a stretch for the Ramones. Yeah, which something to believe in. You know, exactly another track to believe did in. with them, which was also a popular song and video, but it was a little bit you know different as well. That, that's right, exactly. So it was uh, so it was combining those elements and just taking what the Ramones had and you know and and just giving it that little thing. But a lot of times, I see I wrote music to those songs anyways. So it's still taking in my mind what the Ramones are, <laughs> combining what they are into this thing to try to create something. I think that's the best way to say it. Almost like a little bit more intelligent punk. Maybe that's yeah. a good way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm glad you indulged me with all this talk of your, your writing and stuff. I do want to make sure we mention a few things. One, oh. the book that's coming out. We've we got to okay. get to that. Okay. Bet My Soul on Rock and Roll. Rock and Roll. <laughs> a Diary of a Black Punk Icon. This is coming soon. It is available for pre-order. The link is available. Thanks. We've scratched the surface. We scratched yeah, I know. I've got to be careful. I'm sitting here talking. I'm saying, you know what? I shouldn't be saying too much to you because <laughs> nobody's yes. going to buy the book. <laughs> well, I think actually, though, I think it's a good tease. And, you know, the nuances of someone like Wendy or Williams or working with Kiss or the Ramones, That's you true. can't I just know. tell in a, in a, you can't tell in a soundbite. You, you really no, have to read. Right. That's right. You really have to read it and, and to get deeper. And we also didn't really, and so I want to make sure people pre-order. Also, we didn't get so much into your own music, which is Crown of Thorns, Voodoo X, and your solo records. Solo records, that's right. That's best all right, way, all right. We'll get, they'll get there. <laughs> the best way to discover your music, though, is Rock Masterpieces Volume 1 and 2, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, yes. you got to get the first solo record, for sure, but um, Rock Masterpieces 1 and 2 has a, it's it's a compilation of all the things you did. Obviously, it's not going to be the music you wrote because you don't own the recordings. But oh, for one thing, you're talking about for rock, uh, masterpiece? the rock masterpieces records. I'm saying it's a lot of the things from your career, but obviously, you're not going to have like you know Kiss songs and Ramon songs because 
Yeah, it just doesn't have the Kiss and Ramon songs. It has all my, right, exactly. It's all the stuff that I've done through my career from solo records, uh, you know, the things from Crown of Thorns, things from Voodoo X. That, that's basically what it was a combination of. Because I found that a lot of people were confused and people were like, oh, you're the guy who did Feel the Heat. Because Feel, Feel the Heat was a very big pop success. You know what I'm saying? It went top 10 all over Europe. But I mean, like Rihanna. You know, so it's a completely different thing. Then at the same time, you know, then you do you have Voodoo X and Crown of Thorns. A lot of times people didn't put those things together. I'd have people saying, I'm looking for your music. I can't find it anywhere on Spotify. And I'm like, what do you mean? I've got stuff all over Spotify. And it's like, and then I realized, ah, it hit me. They don't know who Crown of Thorns is. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a whole different thing. Well, they don't know who Voodoo X is. They don't know you did Shock, or don't, or the guys who know you from writing for Kiss don't know that you're the guy who did Feel the Heat. It's really, it gets confusing. So yeah. that's why I felt it was a good idea to do this record, Rock Masterpieces, um, Volume One and Two, to at least give people a flavor and a taste of the different things under one umbrella. You know, because yeah. for those bands, even though they were bands, they were really my projects and and me. A lot of times, I played all the instruments. You know, so it's um. <laughs> so it was a band more in a sense of, you know, except, I mean, I'm not saying all because I've had some great musicians, Hawk Lopez, fantastic drummer, you know, Tommy Lafferty played some amazing solos on Crown of Thorns records and stuff. Um, but yeah, it was a good way for, to, to give an introduction of yeah, the and it, stuff like together. And a representation of the music that you've made over those years. Like you said, right. you go to Spotify, you only, it, there's not much detail. You see a name of a band. So That's right. exactly. this is a great way for people to check it out. And I'll have links to that below as well. And of course, your website, jeanbouvois.com, will have a link to that. Thank because you. It's really fun. If you go to your discography on that website, you just get lost, you know, in, in all these um, cool projects. And and a, a, another like tease for the book, we didn't really get into so much, um, you know, of your other career. You, you're writing songs with Debbie Harry. And then, of course, In Sync. We didn't talk about In Sync. <laughs> Who would think? The the, the bass player for the Plasmatics is writing with Justin Timberlake. I, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty funny. Sometimes, you know, when you're doing the work, you just do the work. In other words, things just happen. I'll get a phone call from back in the day when it, when Feel the Heat came out, for example. I get a phone call from Larry Blackman from Cameo. Mm -hmm. Oh man, could you come over and play some guitar, man? I want some of that rock guitar of yours, <laughs> you know, on a Cameo record, you know. So I'm over there and you know and playing lead guitar on Cameo or Nona Hendrix or, you know, end up in sync. And so I could just do these things. And at the time, and still, I like to work. So, and I was really, during those periods of, of, of periods of time, I was really like, like you say, prolific. I got to a point where I was doing a song a day, written, finished, you know, really working a lot and doing a lot of producing and just, I'd work with everybody. So you did not look at it as a whole. You kind of just looked at his work and it's not till years later that you put it all together and you go, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, I put all these things together and it's, uh, When yeah. you sat down to write the book, you must go, well, first you have to jog your mind of all the things mm -hmm. that happened, but you might, you must go, well, I've had some life. <laughs> it's, it's true. It, you know, it's, it dawns on you finally after a while that, you know, especially when things start coming back, you know, when Kiss all of a sudden starts coming back and it becomes more important, you start seeing more about that song. Or one of the things I think that was probably the most shocking was um, on Sirius Satellite, the Christmas channel, um, all of a sudden Merry Christmas came. Yeah. On, I'm talking about the hit channel, the channel with Mariah Carey and, you know. <laughs> you know it's so a, it's a pop Christmas single now, yeah. You know, it's a pop Christmas single and I'm like, Wow, this is 30 years old. It's got blaring guitars, it's got this, but I guess there must have been something that makes it work as a pop single for them. And it sounds good next to Mariah Carey. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it, it makes you happy. It makes It makes you feel like you haven't been wasting your time. That's yeah, what it no, is. For sure. Uh, uh, well said. But uh, so we know about the rock masterpieces, we know about the upcoming book. I know the you know obviously the world is in a strange place right now. Everything's a bit on hold. What is next for you? Because it's not over. You know this is not just a retrospect. There's, there's <laughs> tell me a little well, bit. I'm always doing stuff. I mean, like um, 
uh, you know, I, I actually have a song that's coming up, but this is something completely different. I'm in South Korea. I've done K-pop stuff since, you know, because friends call me up, you know, from Sweden or this and say, hey, you know, I need, I've got a song. I've got an idea. Can you send me, they send me the track. I'll, I'll just the singer, I'll do write a melody, I'll write lyrics, and the next thing you know, that ends up being single for some boys, big boys group in you know South Korea or something, you know, or a Chinese TV show, you know. So I'm always doing that kind of stuff, um, and obviously I'd, I'd like to tour, you know. That's so I'm hoping that now with what's going on, we can, you know, hope hopefully things are going to start, but you know, to open up. But now it looks like things are getting bad again. So it's we're trying it's, to see. Yeah, you know. uh, but would so would you be thinking about doing the tour? That's sort of a, a your whole career. That's what I do. So my last uh, the, the last four years or something that I've been touring right before COVID, I did festivals and a bunch of things. I put it all together as uh, back to Jean Beauvoir. I tour that way, and I play everything. So I play some Crown of Thorns stuff, some Voodoo X. I play things from my solo record, but at the same time I throw in like Shocker, songs that nobody plays, other songs that I might have done for film soundtracks that were hits but nobody's playing them. You know, I'll, I'll play the Ramon stuff, you know, I'll do all kinds of stuff. And I'll just put it all into one show. I might even have, you know, I wrote songs for Glenn Hughes, for John Waite, for some other people, you know, and I realized they're out there playing those songs live, you know, so I'm thinking, huh, maybe that's something I should add to the show. Because, you know, when you write a lot of songs and now I'm going into, I mean, God, it's like thousands or something, thousand something um, songs. You just, you start to forget. You literally forget songs that you have. Like, I mean, I, I went to my computer here in the studio one night and I just, you know, found a hard drive and I found like song after song after song. I'm like, what is that? Oh, that's me. What is that song? I didn't know that. I forgot that song. This song, that song. And I found like 20 songs that I'd completely forgotten about in the past years, you know, and I had to hear them again to actually remember. That right, they're what there. it was for and what you were doing. Yeah, but it sounds like that's a great show and a great kind of storytelling theme to tell the stories of, of your career and play them. And it's also a great way to promote the book. So let's hope that the, the world can straighten mm -hmm. out and people- I know, I hope so. I even do a plasmatic song, by the way. So. Yes, I was gonna say, I should hope so. Of course, one or two, you know. So yeah, you, you, you've got to show that uh, you know all the aspects of your career. All the aspects. That's right. That's right. You know, listen, really everybody stayed safe out there. I'll tell you, it's really crazy what's going on. You know. Yes, it's like nothing anyone could ever imagine in their worst, you know, horror movies. So, know, um, know, but but like you said, hopefully everyone is safe, and hopefully the time yes. comes when we can get back out. But people got some time to do some reading and some music listening, and we That's got a right. bunch the of. Book will be, yeah, the book will be interesting. It's gonna, it's gonna really goes back from the beginning of my life, and it goes through a lot of what we spoke about, but really in detail. You know, all the experiences, everything it goes through plasmatics, or everything, and pretty much everything up to now. So hopefully, it'll be a good read and um, funny and educational to a certain point because. Oh, I'm you know, sure. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of what not to do things that you've learned in your career. That's right. That's right. It's hopefully that could be helpful to a lot of people. Yes. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. And I hope you have a good day. Okay. You too. Thanks. Thank you.